it's been a pleasure at least to see some of your faces here, which is more than I've seen now in what, 14 days at least. And um, I hope you will enjoy the talk as, as, um, as Emma has already said. Um, any question you have, please type them in and I will be very, very, very happy to answer them at the end, uh, at the end of the talk. So Kai, um, now this, this painting you see here is a very, very famous one, which has actually, I think, um, was sold two years ago by Sotheby's at $2 million, $25 million actually. So if I may, it's a famous meeting by Alma Tadema, Lawrence Alma Tadema, so the meeting of Antony and Cleopatra in uh, Tarsus in 41, uh, in 41 BC. And here you see this is the classical representation of what you imagine, you know, what is the Vulgata, what Octavian propaganda would say later on. So that's the seductive Egyptian queen and, uh, and Antony, which looks, of course, absolutely uh, in, a subordinate, is in a subordinate position that just looks at her from the distance. Now, what we will try to see, and this is actually my whole point in this talk, is that this is actually not the case. Um, what we are trying to show is that Antony and Cleopatra, apart from being a couple of famed lovers, were actually incredibly good rulers. They understood that the only way for the Roman Empire actually to survive in the East was creating this sort of alliance between Roman power and one of the triumvirs actually, and the last queen of the last existing Hellenistic kingdom at the time. So this will be the whole point. Now, I begin with this quote, uh, this quote by uh, Shakespeare, Antony Cleopatra. By the way, it was fantastic while I was preparing for this talk to find out that Shakespeare wrote this, um, wrote this, uh, um, this tragedy, this play, sorry, this play while he was uh, hiding coping up and try to escape from the plague in London in 1606. So I found that you see that actually quarantine and apparently social distancing can even serve to create such masterpieces. Now here, going back to the text, here is of course an Octavian speaking to Lepidus. So we are in 41. Octavian and Lepidus are the colleagues of Mark Antony in the triumvirate, so the other two triumvirs. And uh, uh, Octavian at this point uh, is, um, is in Tarsus, is enjoying himself uh, with Cleopatra. And here it is. This is the classic representation of Mark Antony. He is stumbling uh, in, the, in the bed of Ptolemy, okay? And of course, and that is true actually, that's what we think. He, he, of course, he was, what he does is a party goer. He goes to parties, gets drunk at noon and stuff like that. And by the way, let's remember that this is what also Cleopatra will be accused of. I mean, for example, in the, uh, in the Augustan poetry, you have, I don't know, Horace, who talks about Cleopatra being ebria, being drunk, of course, and Cleopatra is in proportion, she's a meretrix, she's a prostitute. So you see, it goes, by the, it goes both ways. Because of course, this was written by Shakespeare, but Shakespeare followed pretty closely, as we will see during the course of this talk, Plutarch. That once again lived at the end of the first century AD, so almost one century after Antony and Cleopatra, but clearly relied on contemporary sources and, of course, on the Augustan propaganda. So just to see. Now, this is the description. I love it. So I have just, so you, you will read it for me because it's better than I, that you read it for yourself than, than I read it aloud with my Italian accent. But you see here the description by Plutarch of this game-changing encounter in Tarsus. So imagine how incredible this must have been, okay? So you have this beautiful ship with Cleopatra dressed as Venus or Isis, which of course there was this synchronism, this going together with these two different deities, Venus and Isis in the East. And 
uh, with young boys painted like Cupid and perfumes and so and so. And what is beautiful anyway is here, at least what's, that's what uh, uh, Plutarch is saying here, that Antony at last was left alone sitting upon the tribunal. Like, you know, but in reality, as we will see, and we will see a repetition of this in 34 BC in Alexandria, Antony himself is styling as Dionysus. So this is, and this is what the people of Tarsus understood, to the, the multitude that Venus had come to feast with Bacchus formed the common good of Asia. I think that in spite of the fact that, of course, there is all these, uh, uh, Plutarch also relies on, of course, Augustan sources, which means the sources written by, at the time, by, at the times of Augustus, uh, and of course, following the, the propaganda, the anti-Antonian propaganda. Here there is this word, for the common good of Asia. So there is really the acknowledgement that here something is going on that actually could be good for the Eastern part of the empire. Okay, here is Asia, of course, which was one of the province, but we can really think that in reality this applies to the Eastern part of the empire. And I love this other representation by Natoire. This, this is uh, um, Antony entering Ephesus. And here you see that he is styled as uh, uh, Dionysus. Now, one thing that is really incredible, really important to highlight is that uh, while Dionysus was very important, a very important deity, uh, also in coinage, uh, in coinage, but very important deity in, uh, in the East, let's imagine also in the Sistover for the Athletes, there are clearly a representation of Dionysi Dionysiac symbols and the ivy crown is very common in several coinages. Remember that the Romans had banned, okay, the Bacchanalia, had banned the Bacchanalia, so all the celebrations of backing rituals uh, in 186 BC. So let's just remember how revolutionary is for a Roman general and a Roman general of the caliber of Mark Antony from a triumvir to style himself after Bacchus. So this is huge. And it tells you that uh, Mark Antony, right from the beginning, is not, of course, already because he wanted to go to the parties and get drunk. And so, of course, Bacchus was a clear, <laughs> pretty good deity to do that. But it's because it's actually telling for people to be Dionysus in the East. And you see here in this, um, of course, in this painting, which is a painting of the 18th century, you see the very interesting mixing of Roman standard and the tirsus and ivy, uh, ivy, um, ivy leaves, ivy crowns, and the menads together with the soldiers, which really gives you the idea of what is the attempt, once again, of Mark Anthony, which was uh, clearly represented here, even in the 18th century, this painter tried to represent what Anthony was trying to do. But now, so let's begin, even before Cleopatra, let's see what is revolutionary about Anthony, um, Anthony policy on coinage. And first of all, he is the one, the first one who chose to have his wives represented on coinage. So something that this is an element, an incredible element that will be absolutely common in the imperial age. Antony, so before Cleopatra, and then we will see what happens with Cleopatra, is the one who puts his own wife, Fulvia, on coinage. Now, then we can think, for example, this one, this Quinarius we see, where Fulvia is represented as a victory, because you see the little wings here. And now, nowadays, we're basically sure that this is Fulvia, because you will see the representation of Fulvia, really with the same facial features and the same hairdo, on the coinage, in a few slides, of a city, of the city of uh, Eumenea, which changed her name, Fulvia, in the province of Asia. So there's no doubt that on those coins, the woman represented is Fulvia. And since the, it's the same portrait, the same facial features as this one, I would say there is no doubt that this is Fulvia. 
So already in 43 BC, so well before uh, meeting Cleopatra, Mark Antony is already into dynastic policy. So you, you have here Fulvia. Fulvia represented as a victory. And uh, once again, another thing which is super interesting in this is um, Quinarius from Lugdunum. Now we don't talk why, of course, Quinarii were much more, uh, much more common than denarii in Gallia. Of course, that's to do with the uh, the Celtic standard, the Celtic weight standard, which was much closer, of course, the uh, Celtic drama was much closer to the Quinarius. But here you can see that here is written Luguduni on the, uh, on the reverse. And then you have A, of course, Anno. And here you can see clearly the number, no? Quadraginta, so the number 40. That is Antony's age. So there is no doubt that this is an homage to Antony and to his family. And the fact that this coin was, uh, uh, is minted in Lugdunum, when that's why it's also, it's both um, recorded in, uh, um, included in RRC and in RPC, it's even more interesting because in RPC that means that perhaps it's not Anthony actually issuing it directly, perhaps could be the local elites actually issuing it, which then are recognizing the dynastic policy and want to homage, uh, homage to make an homage to Anthony with precisely this, the portrait of his wife, Fulvia, and on top of that, even his age. This, uh, this, once again, this is absolutely unique. This is the first time we have, we have anything like that. And the same thing, and you see that it's clearly the same woman, is you we have in 41 BC, Fulvia, once again, represented as, as victory. And here is another Aureus. Um, uh, an Aureus. So you see that this is something that happens. And this is the coin I was talking about. So this is, as I said, this is um, possibly a tetracalcon uh, or amiobol, but a tetracalcon issued by the city of uh, Eumenea, which for the occasion changed her name in Fulvia. And then, of course, after the demise of Mark Antony, changed very quickly her name back in Eumenea. Uh, but you can see exactly the same thing. You see Fulvia with the same bun, so it's clearly her. And once again, represented as, uh, um, as victory. So really, the first Roman woman on a civic coinage in the East, we saw the same woman actually represented on the Guinarius issued in Lugdunum. So it's really absolutely new. Um, and the fact that this was perceived as a very important political element, the representation of a woman on, uh, or actually of Anthony's wife on this coinage, is also shown by the fact that as soon after Actium, most, uh, after Actium, most of this coinage will be countermarked. So I mean, really the, the portrait of Fulvia is usually really almost obliterated by all these countermarks. And on top of that, the city of Eumenea, in order, let's say, to compensate for the faux of having <laughs> the portrait of Fulvia on their coinage, and actually in its coinage, and also changing its name, is one of the first uh, that will dedicate an issue of coinage to Livia, of course the wife of Octavian, Augustus, by that time. So see, once again, how uh, this dynastic policy through his wives, through his women, is already in Antony's head well before meeting Cleopatra. And now we'll see how this will be hidden at. But this is, I think, a very good example. Um, once again, here you have another tetracalcon uh, from, um, from Ephesus. So you have here a presentation of the triumvirs. But what is fantastic here is this very, very rare chalcus, 
calculus from always Ephesus. So it's part of the same series. We recognize Ephesus, of course, you see the B. And here you have, at this point, Octavia. We are, of course, after 41 BC, and we know Octavia married, uh, uh, married uh, um, uh, Anthony, uh, Anthony in 40 BC after the Treaty of Brundisium. And so that's why this is for sure like Octavia. And uh, uh, so even the, his other wife, Octavia, is represented on coinage. Mm -hmm. And of course, another coinage where, he's widely, where Octavia is widely present uh, is the very, very, the very famous, I mean, Michelle Amambri has written so much on it, is the, the, um, the fleet coinage, the fleet coinage of Mark Antony. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time. I wish we could have time to talk about the incredible uh, incredible changes brought in by the fleet coinage in terms of weight standard, in terms of the fact that uh, uh, the Cistercius for the first time in the fleet coinage becomes uh, a base metal coinage, okay? With, with the fleet coinage will be bronze, then from Augustus on will be oricalcum, brass, but it's the same. So this is just to give you the idea, but have a look at this. So you see, the Cistercius here, as I said, this is the first time the Cistercius, instead of being uh, a silver coin, is actually a base metal coin, and this will be a, an absolutely uh, durable innovation. And you see here, once again, Mark Antony facing the bust of Mark Antony facing Cleopatra, uh, Cleopatra sorry, facing Octavia. And once again, just to see you how focused is Mark Antony on his Eastern target, you see that here you have two, um, two different denominational marks. HS, which is of course the Cistercius uh, uh, denominational mark in Latin, and then you have D, of course a, del sorry, a delta, a delta which means four, of course, four asses. So this is, you see, you have the denominational mark both in Latin and in Greek. So you see all these innovations. These are all targeted toward, let's say, a Eastern audience, like a Greek audience. We can talk more about it, but then you see the element, the political dynasty, change in wet standard, change even in medium. Once again, well before Cleopatra. So Cistercius, here you have Atresis, Atresis once again, and you see here the gamma. Hmm? Then you can see here the Dupondius, and of course you can see that underneath, and once again, Anthony and Octavia, and here you see the beta. Of course, it's a Dupondius, so two asses, and then here you see an ass, and once again here you have the Jukaid aids of Anthony and Octavia, and you have the alpha because it's, of course it's only one is the ass. So you see really, this is a semis. Of course, in this case, you have only the semi, the S and not the Greek symbols and also the quadrants. But just to give you the idea how innovative, mm, this is just one of the very few aspects of the, innova of the innovation, very few, what, just one, one of the very, just few of the innovations brought in by the fleet coinage. But then you can have an idea. Here we are just focusing on the dynastic policy here. And just last thing, of course, this is Sophory. I know I don't want to talk more about this is Sophory, but you know, of course, that this is Sophory. There was this reduced standard tetradrachma issued, uh, um, issued in uh, Asia by the Attalids, first in the Attalid kingdom, possibly starting around uh, 166 BC, anyway, during the kingdom of Eumenes II. But just to see, just to show you, they kept the same iconography through basically the first century BC. So these are the late Cistophory, which are the ones issued by the Roma, not the Romans, but in the Roman province of Asia. You have, of course, the, for example, you have, of course, the na names of Roman magistrates on some Cistophory. For example, this is Caius Satinius Labeo in 122-121. But you see that the normal iconography has been absolutely, so the Attalita iconography has been maintained. 
and it's maintained even until 48 BC, where you have clearly all the names of the Roman magistrates on this story. But then Mark Antony arrives, and there you are. Here you are, you have Mark Antony, his portrait on Sistophory, and once again, Octavia. Octavia, you see on the reverse, so you see the Sista Mystica, which is clearly a symbol of Dionysus. And think about Mark Antony presenting himself as Dionysus in Ephesus, what's well, important. And you have Octavia here. So not only his portrait, portrait of Octavia, so he's revolutionizing the iconography of this coinage, which has been the same for 130 years, at least, and endured without changes, even the change between Attali Kingdom and Roman province, but Antony makes it different. And here you have, once again, Mark Antony. This is another Sistophorus of Mark Antony, like two different types for the of Mark Antony. In this case, once again, the Jugate busts of Mark Antony and uh, Octavia. And you have here Dionysus appearing. So think how well concerted all of this is in terms of iconography and how Mark Antony is putting his face and the face of these women, so the mothers of his kids, on the coins. And just one thing, this is, I love it. This is like a, this Sistophorus by Augustus uh, issued uh, exactly possibly beginning 24 BC. You see that Augustus said, okay, that's it. And you see that Pax here is triumphing over the Cista Mystica, over Dionysus. That's really the iconographical victory. So this is Stavros from this moment on will cease to have any reference to Dionysus and Antony in some way, because Antony of course related himself to Dionysus. That's the last of the representation of the Cista Mystica on Sistopoli. For the following 200 years, the Imperial Sistopoli will have no Dionysiac re representation whatsoever. The first one who introduced, anyway, his portrait on, uh, on this uh, Sistopoli was, of course, Mark Antony. Now, we go now, finally, we get to Cleopatra. I love, of course, this painting by Woodhouse. I know that it's uh, very common, everybody. Uh, looks at it, so, but I still find it beautiful, so that's why I put it here. So Cleopatra and the face of power. Uh, even if we see that Mark Antony has already used his former wives as faces of power, so that's, that's clear. Now, this is a flattering portrait of Cleopatra, because now we have at least to talk a little bit about uh, uh, her uh, appearance. Now, uh, once again, I could not resist to a little bit of uh, historical gossip in this case, which is, of course, vouchsafed by Plutarch, so it's not me inventing it. Uh, but you see that, of course, uh, for a beauty, as we're told, was in itself not altogether, altogether incomparable. But of course, the big thing that Cleopatra has is uh, her mastery of languages. is an incredible linguist, is the one who is able actually to speak not only Greek as the other Ptolemies, but the Egyptian, he, he speaks Nabataean, he speaks so many other languages. You see Ethiopian, Hebrew, so he is, she has really a knack for not only languages, but also for propaganda and self-promotion. Because what we have to remember, and this is very important, is that Cleopatra is a queen which has been put on her throne by the Romans. So her, the genesis of her power is absolutely exogenous. Because perhaps you will remember that her father, Ptolemy the uh, twelfth, so-called auletes, so flute player, which is of course not exactly a nice, a nice title, was exiled from Alexandria. And it's Gabinius, Saulus Gabinius, that put him back on the throne. So Cleopatra here was definitely a disadvantage. So let's even set aside, aside all the quarrels with her brother and so. 
But the thing is that Cleopatra was a queen which was put, sat, put back on her throne by the Romans. And the Egyptians were incredibly, incredibly um, proud of, uh, uh, of their millennia uh, tradition of so sovereignty. And it's possible, actually, the fact that uh, uh, Ptolemy XII Auletes uh, could not avoid the Romans appropriating Cyprus in 58 BC that set off uh, all the uh, um, all the, upri uh, up the uprising that then brought to his exile. So let's begin with this. So that's why she definitely is in need of self-promotion. Um, in 48 BC, of course, we know that Cleopatra, before meeting Mark Antony, had been the lover of Caesar. So in 48 BC, Caesar once again helped Cleopatra. So he killed her brother and um, husband. Uh, and of course, gave her the sole ruling over Egypt. So it's not only Cleopatra's father, but also Cleopatra has been put on Egypt as a queen because of the Romans, because of Caesar. And I mean, at this point, again, I would not resist Pascal. The nose of Cleopatra, if it had been shorter, the whole face of Earth would have changed. I just could not, uh, I mean, stop myself from refraining from doing this. And of course, how can we not see Asterix, of course? And once again, you see that uh, uh, Panoramix, the druid, uh, of course, is commenting on the famous nose of Cleopatra. Now, we will talk about the nose of Cleopatra because when you see a coin like this, you think, oh my God, I mean, that's a big nose. Now, we know, and perhaps we have already, and we, we, some of you know this already, but in reality, this nose, this big nose, and also the very protruding chin, are symbols um, of power. So Cleopatra is, I'm not saying that she didn't have a big nose. It's perhaps not even so interesting for us at this point. But the big thing is that Cleopatra over-exaggerates these characteristics of hers on coinage because uh, this is directly linked to power. In the same way in which, you know, even uh, the uh, women, uh, women uh, regions uh, in the pharaonic uh, age uh, would represent themselves with a beard. These are the symbols of power. Um, one thing is that Cleopatra likes to represent herself, and I will show you in a second. She names, she calls herself uh, Tia, sorry, Tia Neotira. Tia Neotera, so the younger, the younger goddess. Now, younger goddess Tia Neotera is a very important title that she shares with another one, another queen of uh, another queen of the same name, like Cleopatra the First, who was a queen of Syria, was a Ptolemaic queen that then married one of the Seleucids and then ruled over Syria. So this thing, imagine that this woman, which was put on the throne by a Roman, by Julius Caesar, in reality is showing on her titles, is showing with her in, in linguistic knowledge that she is the right fit for the imperial, the new imperial um, ambitions of the Ptolemies and also in her title, this is the title of a queen of Syria. So this is really important what we see. And so that's, that's really, you see that how this is all well concerted. Together we are here, I showed you coins of 41 BC. So this is really the year when she meets Ant Antony. Well, Antony, of course, uh, is still even married to Fulvia. So between the time between the time of their encounter in Tarsus and then their folly winter together, and then the time when 
uh, Anthony actually divorced Octavia, 37 possibly, there are like uh, four years. In these four years, Cleopatra is already styling herself as queen of Syria. While Anthony, on the other end, <clears throat> is showing how her, his wives uh, mm, can actually be used as a way to uh, enhance his power, no? to create a dynasty. And here we are. Now we are in the 36 BC. So here a lot of time, of course not a lot of time, but in terms of events, these were momentous years. This means that uh, Antony now has handed, uh, definitely is, uh, um, is uh, um, matrimony, his marriage with Octavia. He is now fully committed to Cleopatra and their then joint vision for a Roman Egyptian, um, of a Roman Egyptian joint power, let's say. And uh, these, uh, the tetradrams um, from Antioch perfectly represent these. This is, uh, by the way, before I begin to comment on the titles, which are super important, I would like you to notice uh, this beautiful, this horse here is possibly a mint mark. These are, this is one of the four specimens known. Possibly means that this tetradrap was not minted in Antioquia, but somewhere else. We don't know anyway. This is a beautiful specimen and I just want to have it on my slides so that you can, let's say, enjoy the view, the sight of a beautiful coin. So let's begin here. I mean, here, as you know, this is really here, right on the obverse, that is Basilissa Cleopatras, and on the rev reverse is Antonius. And here, of course, you see that the images are actually put in the wrong way then. But in reality, it's not such a big mistake because my whole point in showing you this coinage is that this coin, is that this coin, these Antiochian tetradrums, represent, are, have basically two obverses. So these are peers. You see, two of them, the two of them, Antony and Cleopatra, are represented as peers with their titles. Cleopatra is, of course, a Basilissa, Basilissa, Cleo, Basilissa Cleopatra Stia Neotera. So, of course, it's a like queen, uh, the queen Cleopatra, the younger goddess, and we have already seen how the title Tianenotera resonates in Syria, because it was already used by another Syrian queen of, of Ptolemaic descent one century uh, before. And Antony is a, a consul and, of course, is a triumvir. So these are their titles. Let's imagine this is super important. It's important to have them represent as joint sovereigns because these tetradrums are possibly used to actually are basically certainly used to finance uh, the doomed Parthian campaign of Mark Antony that will end in defeat the following year. Now, Antony has then, Antony has been cut off from the West in order to face the, the enemies of Rome, the famed enemies of Rome that, that defeated the Romans in, 40, in 53 BC in Carrai and uh, basically killed Crassus too. The only ways that he has to, um, to uh, he has only Cleopatra to count on. And so they are, they are here together, the joint sovereigns in this beautiful coin. But what happens? As I said, in 35 BC, Antony's army is defeated, and Antony then conquers with the help of Cleopatra in 34 BC Armenia. And after that, he celebrates in Alexandria a triumph. 
a triumph that is mocked because of course how can you celebrate a triumph in Alexandria the triumph of course could be only celebrated in Rome but Antony while still a Roman general is cut off from Rome so he has to celebrate it in Alexandria because he has to but also because at this point he, need, he and Cleopatra are together because they are enhancing each other's power. And that's what the donations of Alexandria are about. Because Antony, as we know, declared Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt, of Cyprus, of Libya, of, Cele of Celesiria, and then of course declares all her other children, the children they had together, but also Caesarion, which was the child uh, Cleopatra had from uh, Julius Caesar, queen, uh, kings and queen of all the other parts of Roman, of the Roman actually, eastern part of, uh, sorry, of the eastern part of Roman Empire. But once again, even if I, I'm not, uh, uh, it's not here, I'm not, I didn't, uh, um, I didn't copy it on the slides, in the donation of Alexandria, Antony and Cleopatra are on two thrones and one is, is uh, styled himself as, as Dionysus and the other one is Isis Venus. So there is a perfect specularity between the first encounter in 41 BC and then the donations of Alexandria, 34 BC. And here is, of course, the donations of Alexandria, how it works. And here you have another, the coinage of Spernaica, following the donation of Alexandria. And here you have, once again, Antony Eupatos for the third time, actually talks about his possibly imperatorial salutations. Once again, it's too long to debate here, but you see that they are issuing coinage together. This is fantastic. You see, one side is Antony, the other side is Cleopatra. So much for Antony being a subservient and um, subservient to Cleopatra. They are together. Together, they give, they legitimize each other. And then here you have these other, um, these other denarius. Uh, uh, this denarius uh, which celebrates the victory of Antony. You see Antony Armenia de Victa, so the, uh, the victory of Antony on Armenia, 34 BC. And here you have Cleopatra Regina Regum Filiorum Regum. So Queen Cleopatra, uh, Queen Cleopatra, of course, uh, um, also the mother, basically the mother of mother of queens, of king and queens, of course. So you, you can see both of these. So these are, sorry, this is the numismatic correspective, uh, correspective of the donation of Alexandria, this denarius of 32 BC. Once again, both of them are represented, two of verses. While, for example, here in this in Patras, we don't know why there is only Cleopatra here represented. Possibly there were specific, specific uh, loyalty relationships to, between Patras and Cleopatra. Of course, we are right before Actium. So that's why, of course, the, the Ptolemaic army is encamped. I just would like you to notice that, for example, in this uh, portrait here, Cleopatra lacks uh, most of the uh, the big nose, for example, is not as pronounced uh, as, and also the pointy chin is not as pronounced because possibly, as I say, that on the other coin that we've seen, that was an over-exaggeration in order of facial features in order to show her power. Now, uh, another thing that I want to show you before, of course, uh, we end up, unfortunately, this, uh, this talk uh, is, of course, the famous uh, crocodile. I mean, the crocodile, as you, uh, is, uh, was considered a symbol of Egypt. And uh, you know, uh, and a symbol of Egypt. Now you see it appearing for the first time on provincial coinage, uh, provincial coinage, uh, with the series of Crassus in Cyrenaica. Then, of course, uh, 
you have it, of course, there is the famous, very famous denarius that I don't have it about the Egypto, uh, Egypto capta, where, the, where you have the crocodile. You have here in this uh, coin issued in Gallia, and you have here the uh, heads of Agrippa and Augustus, and you have here the crocodile, so the representation of the victory over Cleopatra. You have here this another this Cleopatra on, I mean, uh, this representation from a lantern from Gallia, which Cleopatra on a crocodile, and you can see it's a quite an obscene representation, but just to give you the idea of the, of course, the connection between the crocodile and Cleopatra. But why am I showing this to you? You know very well that uh, in spite of the fact that Antony and Cleopatra were defeated, Octavian not only and not only maintained several of the iconographic innovations, for example, the, per, the presence of the portrait of the imperator, not the emperor, because Mark Antony was not an emperor, but was a winning general, so an imperator, and of his wife, so the, the, like the dynastic importance of the portraits on coins. We know that he maintained the Cestertius, which was then Cistercius, the bronze Cistercius, the base metal Cistercius. We know, even if we will talk more about it, which I mean, again, not talk about it, the weight standards. He also maintained, and this is incredible, the dynastic uh, uh, policy of Mark Antony. Because, uh, for example, the children, for example, Cleopatra Selene, the daughter of Mark, uh, Mark Antony and Cleopatra, was then queen of Mauritania, as it was actually, it had been decided in 34 BC by uh, Mark Antony and Cleopatra at the donation of Alexandria, and was then, uh, Cleopatra Selene then became the wife of one of the client kings. And so another child of Mark Antony became, uh, sorry, another grandchild of Mark Antony became uh, uh, became the, the Pitodoris, uh, became the queen of Pontus, which was another of the client kingdoms of Mark, uh, of, of uh, like, um, established, uh, uh, maintained, let's say, by Octavian Augustus. And here you see how still here we are in 2 BC, Cleopatra Selene reproduce here and reappropriates in this coinage in Mauritania, the crocodile, the symbol of the Ptolemies. So she is, of course, proud of her Ptolemaic ancestry, which was, as we know, maintained to Mark Antony. So just to say that Mark Antony and Cleopatra literally lived on in their children and in all, most of their innovations that were then maintained by their arch enemy, Octavian Augustus. And here you see the Mark Antony and Cleopatra once again. So the miserable cha change now at my end, lament nor sorrow at. These are the last words of Mark Antony. Because of course, I, Mark Antony says, I'm a Roman by a Roman valiantly vanquished, which is exactly the point. Mark Antony is a Roman who introduced a new way to be Roman in the East, a new way for the Romans to govern, to rule over the East, which was then maintained over then the centuries. And then I end with this beautiful, beautiful uh, slide. I mean, that's another beautiful thing. This is Cleopatra and Mark Antony um, dying, uh, uh, holding Mark Antony dying here. So, uh, this is the end for me now. I will now, uh, of course, I'm very happy now to answer as many questions as you have. I will stop sharing my screen so that I can actually check. So, um, could you give uh, any sources for interpreting a big nose and chin as uh, uh, symbols, uh, symbols of power? Uh, in reality, the big thing here is not also um, 
here is not the big chin and uh, uh, nose per se, but it's the fact that uh, Cleopatra styles herself after the portraits of the former Ptolemies. So it's not a big nose and the chin. I think I was not, uh, I was not uh, clear enough uh, before, um, but it's the thing that she wants to look as much as possible as the other Ptolemies. In the same way, I'm thinking about the portraits of the Augsburgs, for example, now with the protruding, the protruding, the protruding uh, uh, lips, uh, were actually a big sign of the fact that you were part of that family. So uh, Cleopatra is uh, clearly a member. The last one of the Ptolemies is put on the throne back by the Romans, but she styles herself as much as she can as the previous Ptolemies. So that I would say is actually not, it's not uh, the, the big nose and the chin per se. I mean, while uh, the Dionysus Technitae, and um, I mean, I'm very well aware of, uh, of uh, their uh, importance. Uh, I think here, at least as far as I can tell, but here, unfortunately, it's, very, it's much, it's a, very, it's a big pity that I cannot hear you because that's exactly what you studied, that is your specific, uh, Ex field of expertise, so perhaps you could tell me more. Because in my idea, uh, he is actually is wearing the, uh, the ivy crown on the Sistophori because he is Dionysus. Just since, uh, I mean, he enters, uh, is uh, like programmatic, he enters Ephesus dressed as Dionysus and he presents himself as Dionysus uh, on the Sistophori. And, uh, uh, and even more, you know, he has even uh, uh, Dionysus in one of, as you know, in one of the two types of Sistophory, of the two um, uh, reverses types, you have the Sistophory, you have actually uh, Dionysus, which is basically crowning him. So there is on one side uh, the crowned Octavian, on the other side, the basic Dionysus crowning him. But once again, uh, please, I'm so sorry that I, I can see that I cannot hear you. I mean, can you hear I can, me now? Yes. Tell me, okay, do you know okay. anything specific about the... So, the my, my theory is, because I've been working on the ruler cult end. Yes. Because I think it's absolutely central to what Antony's doing in the absolutely. East. And, and either with his, with his Roman wives or with Cleopatra, um, I think Octavia especially at the beginning. Um, I also think that it's because of how ruler cult, cult works and that you wear gotism piece where he's the benefactor. I think that possibly the Dionysus connection actually started with the cities and maybe not with him. Um, and, and maybe, yes, he probably did pick it up and run with it. Um, but I think it changes over time. Um, but that Technitai connection, um, it's one of my kind of hypotheses for the Sistophory um, because I think it's, somewhat strange that he's wearing the IV crown. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to think, okay, well, other than just saying, well, he thinks of himself as Dionysus incarnate and, and go totally with the propaganda side of it, uh, what, what other explanation could there be? And Plutarch tells us, uh, and this would be down at about 32, when there's that scene on Salamis with Cleopatra, there's that kind of festival that goes on. Mm -hmm. um, the Technitai are there. And we do have a letter uh, from Antony to the Technitai, or a, a synodos that is similar to it or connected to it in some way, um, confirming their privileges, right? Which are very, very important in terms of yeah, yeah, yeah. taxes, military service. Yeah, Michela Nushit, I think, wrote a book on the technique of Dionysus. Yes, so yeah. That's absolutely fundamental. And yes, yes. Yeah, and it's not clear where that letter belongs in, in dating, but I thought if there was an early connection um, with the Technitai before 32, absolutely, um, that is somewhere around the time that those Sistophori were minted, probably early in 38, um, you know, if he had received some sort of honors from the Technitai, the ivy wreath could be part of that because they are known 
to bestow an ivy wreath upon people that they're honoring. And it's happened with the Ptolemies before. <clears throat> but it's, it, the evidence is really, it, it's hypothesis. Um, and I haven't been able to do enough digging um, to really try to figure that out if there's more of a concrete connection earlier on. But that whole, again, that whole idea of him as the benefactor and this common good of all Asia and this power play that's going on. Uh, uh, I don't know if there is anybody with, I see Oliver, I don't know if Oliver has uh, other ideas, but uh, for me, I would say you are absolutely, I mean, inspired, even if uh, your hypothesis of the direct connection with the technitae of the Inazis could not be substantiated because exactly we don't have the data, I think you are absolutely right about the fact that it's not Anthony inventing himself, like it has this idea, megalomaniac it's, idea it's that he's Dionysus. Right? But it's precisely, it's the cities who want him to sell himself as Dionysus. So that's exactly, thank you actually, because this is a very important, uh, you give me the, the possibility actually of being much more precise. Yes, yes, I don't believe in any moment that he really believed he was Dionysus. Well, maybe that's, later, I don't know. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's, we don't say exactly. It's well, apart from the, exactly, part of the hypothesis, we don't know, whatever. Yeah. But it's really part of that fact that, exactly, like, imagine, like, we have all the cult of Dionysus, Catechemon, of course, they are the, the, the technique of Dionysus. So Dionysus is absolutely central for all these cities. And Anthony wants to style himself uh, as uh, uh, somebody who understands the series very well. well. And it's and the so language, right? It's the right language. And it's exactly. and it's the process of Hellenistic ruler cult, where it was a royal phenomenon, being transferred to the new, the new people at the top of the power structure. Yes. Right? So it totally makes sense. Um, but that it's Dionysus. Look, Katie, I'm totally with you yeah. because oh, that's the, that's yeah. exactly, and you know that I usually, I, 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 but that's exactly where they meet uh, with Cleopatra yeah. because Cleopatra is enacting exactly the same thing. So he's oh. enacting, uh, because we know that the, the Alexandrians, exactly like the Alexandria, the only way actually for her to, there is a beautiful actually article by Catherine Welch of 2014, where he talks about uh, the, the question of the maestas, uh, the, magis the majesty in uh, Alexandrian for the Alexandrians. So actually Cleopatra in, in uh, Catherine's Welch, uh, uh, Catherine's Welch interpretation, um, the only way actually for Cleopatra to maintain her uh, power in Egypt uh, is to show uh, that she can keep up with the romance, so basically. And so styling herself, for example, as Tia Neotera, as Nea Isis, uh, she's actually going there. That's what her people want. Yeah. That's and, but it's also hers by right. right? It's like, hers by right, I'm... but that's what the people want. Uh, and yeah. so that's, that's exactly that. You have two people. I mean, in the case of Mark Antony, he's more revolutionary because he's Roman. And so he's now beginning to talk uh, the same language that Cleopatra is talking to her people, literally the same iconographical uh, uh, language. So that's where they actually meet. And that's the whole point of actually this talk is that they meet on this level. And this was yeah. the uh, thing that was absolutely understood by everybody in the East that of course could be then used by um, Octavian in the West uh, mm -hmm. to, um, present an entirely different element. But I just want to say that even in the West, of course, uh, Octavian, Octavi uh, sorry, Ant Anthony, wife, uh, Anthony wife was represented as victory. So of course they would not represent her. So a victory, which was something which was more acceptable, I guess, in the West, because of course on coins, you had already representation of victory. Well, before then, and so that's possible. Anyway, sorry, I mean, I got uh, carried away, but. That, I mean, that's, we're right in the same realm yeah. here. I mean, that's um, where I'm working from with Anthony is that, you know, like you got to leave the propaganda aside, right? Because yeah. he's in the East. Let's look at that context. And that's where actually the coins uh, give us because the possibility. That's what explains it, right? Yes. And, yes. and yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of 
Antony and Cleopatra coming together, yeah, they're speaking a common language there, right? Yes. And being driven by the processes that are already in place. Yes. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay, no, thank you. You still owe me, uh, owe me your dissertation, remember? Oh, that. I thought I sent it. I don't know. No. Anyway, uh, sorry, I just gone with the rest. Oliver, I wonder if the use of Tia Neotera can really be evidence of claims to Syria. The full title of the series was actually Theoteria, Goddess of the Fruitful Season. Oliver, you are, I mean, this is why, why it's so fantastic to have you here, have you all here, because you are actually the experts uh, in, um, in talking about the Tia Neotera. I was actually reporting what was, uh, um, I mean, Batri's idea about this, and it yeah. made sense in, uh, let's say, my vision. But I actually would, um, would like to have you, um, you're right, I mean, we can even think uh, that perhaps uh, you have, exactly, you have a Cleopatra Tia, and then, of course, uh, it's not Cleopatra first, but it's Cleopatra Tia, and then it's Cleopatra actually Tia Neotera. So she's the new Cleopatra Tia. So instead of saying the young goddess, I don't, the younger goddess, because for Batri, this was uh, like Cleopatra can be exactly like seeing as the younger goddess. But we can also think that is Cleopatra Tia Neotera as, and we translate it as Cleopatra Tia. So of course the title of another of the Seleucid queen, but, and the younger one. Now, um, I think uh, there was, but please, uh, really, I want to see, I want to hear what, so please unmute your microphone and tell me what your ideas are about this, Oliver. Uh, but I don't know if there is, uh, you know, we cannot be in the, in the mind of Cleopatra. I don't know if there were like specific claims to Syria, but for sure she wants to be in that mindset, you know, of an imperial, a new, in, an, a new empire for the Ptolemies. And this buys into these ideas. So I don't think that this was a way to legitimize necessarily herself, but she's now, it's exactly that, it's a kind of self-representation. She presents herself as the new Cleopatra Tia. So possibly she can be, you know, you know the new and legitimate queen. But please tell me what you think, Oliver. Well, I, I, for one thing, I, I wonder if the memory of the Seleucid Cleopatra Thea was so strong you know, a hundred years, almost a hundred years after, yes. after her death, that she could have great relevance for uh, for Egyptian Cleopatra. And um, when uh, when you get Cleopatra Thea on on Seleucid coins, mm -hmm. it seems to be a reduction of of the the full title that that occurs on some tetragrams rather than uh, an indicator that her, her, her proper title was Cleopatra the goddess. Mm -hmm. um, I think Euateria uh, is supposed to be un understood, but because there wasn't enough space on, on the coins uh, to give her full titulature alongside usually, you know, Antiochus the, the seventh mm -hmm. or, or, uh, or eighth, um, you just you just couldn't fit everything on, and so I think readers were supposed to under, understood that her her full, full title was a goddess of the the, the fruitful season, mm -hmm. and and since Egyptian Cleopatra doesn't have the addition of Euateria on her on her title, I'm I'm not sure that this this argument for for linking the two queens is is particularly strong, although it seems to be fairly popular as an yes, idea. Yes, I mean, like, um, you're right. It's one of those things. I mean, even, Allah, first of all, you know that uh, uh, it's true. I, I also, I'm always skeptical about, uh, about exactly the idea that people could remember, I don't know, uh, coin types and then coins. Of course, not only queens and queens, but also coin types, uh, 100, uh, 
years later, but we have so many examples also of Roman coinages, of restitutio coinages, yeah. that tells, that actually tends to indicate that apparently people were able to have some sort of memory, or at least some part of the population could know. So, I mean, my, um, I do think that even in this case for the Tianeotera, I think uh, that it's very difficult, uh, it's very difficult to, you know, to be 100% positive about, uh, unless we have any sort of literary source, what it means. But actually the fact that the title of uh, Cleopatra Tia was shortened on coins, uh, that, that makes sense because then actually it's possible that the coin, had, actually we know that this, this was usually the case, coins of Cleopatra Tia could still be perhaps circulating. And then if you have a Cleopatra Tia Neotera, then people could make actually the match. While, for example, like what I'm saying is that, what I'm trying to say is that once again, we are, it's hypothetical, but it's always, it strengthens this idea that she is trying to uh, construct her image as uh, um, a legitimate, a possible, and very possible, and actually a, a queen by right, eventually, a possible successor of the Seleucids, for example. I mean, can we be sure about this? Really or no. But it could make sense if you think, uh, if you think that, for example, that title actually Tiani Otera, I have to make more research on that, but I'm pretty sure that uh, appears um, for, uh, for the first time exactly on those tetradrachs in Antioch. I have to check better, but then this would strengthen much more this idea that, of course, it has to appear and appears in Antioch where it makes more sense and where, of course, uh, the, the, the memory the eventually of the original Cleopatratia and coinage of Cleopatratia would still be circulating. But once again, it's just part of this uh, uh, process. I mean, but thank you so much. Oh. Thank you, Oliver, really. There is that older argument as well with that Neotera portion mm -hmm. that there's actually a separate goddess in mm -hmm. Egypt. Yes, yes, like yes, context, yes. But when you go back in the scholarship, yeah, that's actually the one that uh, I think Batri tried to debunk back in 1953, we're talking. So we're talking about pre-1953 arguments. So, I mean, yeah. so yeah, it's all uh, very muddy, right? It's yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, once again, I mean, my personal idea is just, uh, and that was the whole point, uh, is just trying to see it as a farther element. Uh, then we, I don't I don't know, I hope uh, you, Oliver, and you, Katie, will be able to pinpoint perhaps the precise reference. But what is important here, I guess, in general for scholarship, that we see it as an element, uh, one, one little brick, you know, in the construction of this uh, self-image as exactly a legitimate queen for all the East, the entire East under the Romans. Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree with that because it's just so coincidental with the territorial grants that are reinforced by the domains. It's coming up in the epigraphic record as well. Yes. Um, you know, she's co-ruling with um, Caesarian mm -hmm. and she is an, a descendant of the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. Mm -hmm. So who better, right? And, and yes, I do agree also with, with Oliver in terms of, and you yourself in terms of memory, right? And, and, you know, would people make the connection? Are there other coins circulating that, that reinforce it or not? But I think the, the power play is just, it's really compelling. Yeah. It's, and, how, uh, and, and her costume as well, right? Um, Susan Walker has made the, the argument that it's, um, well, it's a very Eastern, Parth it's a Parthian costume that she's wearing on those tetradrams and on those coins from yes Bali. yes yes oh, yes oh, yes no. yes um that it's yeah, which makes very much sense that since it's they were like that financing the, yeah this expanded empire that she has gained oh my god right? yes so, beautiful so look uh, uh katie please let's have a chat the two yeah. of us so, no no really i love this i mean seriously yeah. i'm not uh 
but uh, let's see because I have other questions. Yeah, of course. No. no, no, no. And it's my personal pleasure to listen yeah. to this, but perhaps let's see, I, I will answer to the other questions. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. No, 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 really. And, uh, but but uh, I'll write you okay. and I expect, okay. So, uh, oh, nobody, nobody, uh, no more questions for anybody else? Well, at this point, anybody can unmute themselves if they have a question yes. now, so we won't disrupt the lecture. So, no need to type it out if anyone wants to say anything. <laughs> we scared <Yeah>. them. <laughs> um, Lucia, do you know if anyone's doing any more work with those mints in Syria, like Calcus and, because uh, there was somebody, I think, in France that was working on so Isn't some that uh, uh, here Oliver, uh, Oliver Hoover, I call on Oliver Hoover, who is our uh, here Syrian expert uh, here. I mean, I think uh, um, Julien Olivier was working. Uh, I, I remember last time I talked uh, with him in, uh, was in Paris uh, last year, and he was working on some of these. I mean, there was I, a female was... scholar that you put me in touch with, and I've lost access to the email because it was in my... Emory account. No, but, uh, but uh, look, uh, you are talking actually here, uh, uh, Oliver is, uh, I know. I'm, I'm yes, exactly, so is a great, uh, a great expert on this and actually on the, um, um, he, uh, I mean, there is a part of uh, this collection I'm, I'm cataloging and actually Oliver is, uh, will be helping me with the Syrian part where there is like, we have a lot of, uh, specimens uh, of uh, that specific coinage of Antony and Cleopatra that I've shown. There are like several of those. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm pretty sure that is uh, like Julien Olivier was working on it. I mean, I, 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 that's what it, but I think he hasn't published anything yet on it. That's what I, as far as I know. Okay, so anybody else? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, okay, no. So they, I think they are just saying bye-bye uh, to me. So anyway, um, thank you. Really, thank you. Thank you. Give me a round of applause. No, I mean, like, it's fine. No, 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 no. May I say thank you so much for your <laughs> questions. This was fantastic because, I mean, uh, I have to say that it's nice to have uh, people in the same room, but I think this uh, would not be possible uh, for me to have all these people and actually even to discuss with you, Oliver or Katie or anybody else. I mean, if it was not for this, uh, for this medium. So it's pretty cool. So thank you. Thank you really to everybody or any other questions? Okay, so you, you got tired of me, so yeah. <laughs> never, no, no, really, and, uh, but never tired of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, all of you. It was a great pleasure. And um, see you next time, you know, like uh, perhaps uh, we are going to record a podcast, perhaps on Mark Antony follow us on this yes, and uh, <laughs> thank you so much everybody have a thank good you, weekend Lucia. okay bye 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 bye, bye, -bye. <laughs>